This video is brought to you by moviepalette.com and enter ROOM15 for 50% off of your palette. Hey horror fans, welcome back to 237, back with another review. As I continue my run through of films based on real life serial killers, uh, Hey horror fans, welcome back to 237, back with another review. So I continue my run through of films based on real life serial killers. And this is kind of continuing what I did in my last review, which was the 2002 film Speck, based on the mass murderer Richard Speck. I do want to emphasize mass murderer. Uh, a, lot, a lot of places, a lot of people call him a serial killer. Technically, by the name of the law, by definition, he is a mass murderer. Uh, even for this film, you, you look up uh, some reviews on IMDb, so all these people claiming to be huge, like, true crime enthusiasts, passionate true crime enthusiasts, but they keep calling him a serial killer. Actually, some of them even got the number of nurses that were killed wrong or the date of the attack wrong. But yeah, he is a mass murderer. It was all one attack in one place. He was never officially linked to any murders prior to that. But my last review was the 2002 film Spec, and that was really, really low budget. But I was actually surprised by the accuracy and how well it told the story despite its budget. This I actually thought, despite the director and writer who has been has had more uh, misses than hits, at least with me so far. Uh, I thought this was going to be the better of the two, at least in quality, but I was wrong. The 2002 film is better all around. I might say that the actor playing Speck in this one was a better Richard Speck, but that's really the only thing to take away from this film. In fact, almost every review I've read has said that. And it is the 2007 film, Chicago Massacre, Richard Speck. And yes, that is Cora Nemec playing Speck. Cora Nemec, uh, really good actor. Uh, you know, he played Harold in the 90s version of The Stand. He actually played Ted Bundy, I think, the following year, which I have reviewed the Bundy film he was in, so you can check that out. Someone on IMDb even mentioned that he's played other serial killers, Ted Bundy, but they also mentioned Boston Strangler, The Untold Story, which Michael Piper also did. That was, no, that was not Cora Nemec. <laughs> Unless there's something about that film, I don't know. I have it, but I haven't got to it yet. Now, Cora Nemec does do fine as spec. I mean, whether it be his sort of uh, his attitude or his bravado or the bravado he tries to put out or, you know, sort of the southern drawl that he has. Sometimes it's over the top. Uh, he is portrayed as, you know, this over the top tough guy that just loves to fight, cause trouble, cause pain. So that's another, this is another film similar to 2002 that doesn't really show Speck as... The coward that he was you know it, it, if he did have booze in him and when the cops were involved he, he was pretty cowardly uh, he, he really only turned on his badass switch or what he thought was badass you know when he had had some drinks and when you know he's faced with a more vulnerable victim he was known to be pretty cowardly in real life but yeah, written and directed by Michael Pfeiffer. Now, so far from him, uh, I've done, I think it was, I think he did do Bundy Legacy of Evil with Cora Nemec, uh, BTK with Kane Hodder, Drifter Henry Lee Lucas, uh, Boston Strangler Untold Story, which I have, but I haven't seen that one yet. I, I haven't got to that one yet. 
Uh, Ed Gein Butcher Plainfield. That was one I was going to get, but I never got around to picking that one up. I think it was the BTK video where I said he's kind of like the glorified Uwe LaBelle, where his films aren't quite as bad. Uh, I put Uwe LaBelle at the bottom. As far as directors that have done numerous films like this, I put LaBelle down at the bottom. And then either Pfeiffer or Andrew Jones right here. Actually, I don't think Andrew Jones has done as many, but and more of his are actually more fictional. But yeah, I would say Pfeiffer. He's he's above Uwe Lamel, but not by much. This is one of those. This is another one of his uh, uh, misses. Uh, I would actually liken this to the Bundy film that he did that Cora Nemec was in because there are times where it looks good. He does find as the title character, the title killer, but the film itself either leaves a lot out or fictionalizes a lot of it. Uh, a lot of this film is highly fictionalized, uh, especially how a good portion of the film is this one detective trying to go after him. It's sort of all the leads to finding Richard Speck, who he figures out who it is, and him unable to catch him. When in reality, no one knew Richard Speck was the name of the perpetrator until his suicide attempt. So a lot of this film is highly fictionalized. Uh, you only get glimpses of his backstory, his childhood, through brief flashbacks. It shows glimpses of his extensive uh, criminal history. Like We only see him get arrested once for stealing a truck. Uh, you know, it doesn't get into his numerous burglaries or thefts or armed robberies, rapes, uh, or the time he stole 70 cartons of cigarettes from a grocery store and sold them in the parking lot. It doesn't get into his numerous arrest history. Uh, it does show a bit of his wife, uh, which was, they were married four years before the attack. So very little about his life out, outside or prior the Chicago attack is shown. In the Chicago attack, it doesn't really show much. Now, to me, that doesn't really bother me as long as everything else is at least a little bit accurate or at least tweaked a little bit this is a highly fictionalized film i mean it shows them breaking into the nurse's home sort of rounding up the ones that are there and then when the first one that was out comes home he grabs her and then it just kind of cuts to black opens up to a new story about the eight bodies found and then throughout the rest of the film, we get brief flashbacks where he drags another one into the separate room and kind of shows what he does to them. I will say the trailer makes this look a lot more graphic than it is. Uh, this is a Lionsgate film. So I was expecting it to be a bit more, not that it needs to be. I did read reviews where people were mad that it wasn't more along the lines of a torture porn film you know graphically gory or violent which you can do with a richard speck movie i mean he was vicious but you know i've also read reviews and it doesn't just go for this film where people say it's pointless because it didn't show the murders it's garbage because it wasn't disturbing as if every serial killer film needs to be as shocking and depraved as August Underground or it's not good. Which just brings me back to my point of one of the surface level uh, true crime fans as opposed to the real enthusiasts that just want to know about the story as a whole. So yeah, the, not much about this film or not much to this film. If you look, you can see Coronemic's face is pretty fucked up it, it doesn't quite look like that in the movie that is because uh one of speck's main traits were the deep uh what's the word pot pocked I, or 
hot pocket or whatever it's called. When someone has really bad acne and there's the scars that stay, you know, that was a, one of Speck's defining sort of uh, features. Even though it looks believable, uh, I would say it's a bit much. It, it didn't look near, Speck's face didn't look nearly as you know extreme as the makeup they did on Nemec. They, it looks like they tried to make it more extreme so it would draw attention or show that they did, added that detail. But, so yeah. So the film itself, uh, written, directed, and produced by Michael Pfeiffer. I think he actually won Best Producer at the Beverly Hills Film Festival, where this initially premiered in 2007. Stars Cora Nemec, as I said, um, Andrew Divoff, who of course was in, he played Wishmaster in the first Wishmaster. He's also in the Boston Strangler Untold Story film that I have. He plays the uh, the uh, detective that's tracking him down. Brief appearance by Tony Todd, who's this uh, other detective. He's not, he's only in it for a few minutes. Of course, Tony Todd is Candyman. Uh, I didn't even recognize who she was. I kind of forgot she was in this. <clears throat> but uh, uh, Debbie Rashawn, who's known to be in more extreme or more hardcore horror, almost borderline softcore films. Uh, I think the only film I've done that she was in is Brian Nicholson's Hangar. I knew she was in it, but I, I I could even place her in it. And of course, no names are the same other than Specs, which was one thing that really impressed me by the 2002 film is that everyone had their real name. And it made it e it actually made it harder to tell who was who as far as the nurses go. Because, I mean, they do have a Filipino actress playing, what was her name? Lozano? Uh, Sandra Azano as the sole survivor. Uh, Corazano Amaro, which is her real name. Uh, she's the only one that you can really tell who is supposed to be that one. Now... As I said for the previous film, since no one really addresses anyone by name, it's hard to tell who is who. Here, where they all have different names, and it doesn't really show the order. I mean, the flashbacks are kind of out of sequence, so you can't tell how accurate they all are. Now, I think it implies that he does sexually assault all eight of them, where... In real life, he only did that to one, and that was the last one, Gloria Davy, which it's shown through implication, but there is strong implication when he goes after that one. But the way she, like, she was killed in a separate room in the film where in real life she was the one that was assaulted on the bed that Amara was hiding under. So it's really hard to tell who's supposed to be who since the names are different and the places and where the where and how they were killed mostly differ but throughout most of the film i mean it's either andrew divoff following leads or it's just speck doing what he does in between the murders and him going to the hospital for a suicide attempt with flashbacks of his past or the murders put throughout now one thing i did not mention in the history of richard speck in my last review which is because i knew this film touched upon it is this film does shed light on the infamous and controversial 1996 uh, prison video which came out five years after he died there was a video that I can't remember who filmed it or who got it, but I think it originally aired on American Justice. It might have been American Justice because I remember Bill Curtis being on it, where it showed Spec. I think it took place 90 or 91, uh, and showed him without his shirt, 
and we see that he had been using growth hormones because he now has breasts, he's overweight, shows him with copious amounts of cocaine, and eventually performing fellatio on his cellmate and talking about all the fun he's having and it does go into how he enjoyed killing all those nurses and the line if they knew how much fun I was having they'd let me loose that's how the film opens it opens with him smoking a cigarette saying that line if they knew how much fun I was having then we get the film and then at the very end it doesn't show the whole thing, obviously, but it shows essentially what was shown on American Justice. I think some of the lines were written for the film because from what I've seen, Speck doesn't talk that much in that video, but it shows sort of what you can find on YouTube and what was on American Justice at the very end. So yeah, there's a video of Richard Speck doing that and this movie shows it in fact that one bit might be one of the more accurate portrayals of the story of Richard Speck throughout the entire thing anything that is accurate uh there are a couple things that are accurate to the point where they're not really tweaked they really show it as it was but what's kind of hard when it comes to Speck is and I said this in my last review, I'm not as well versed in the story of Richard Speck as I am other stories, you know, Ted Bundy, Joe Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Gary Ridgway, or, you know, killers like that. I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm well versed in th those stories so I can watch a movie and I can tell what's fictional, what's not. Spec, not so much. I pretty much know the barest of essentials of his past, the murders, and, you know, trial to death. Uh, but, and I don't have any books specifically on Spec. I, I have seen some documentaries, which, he's in this American Serial Killers one, which kind of surprised me, because he's not a serial killer, but Charles Whitman is also in it. But I do have this book of mass murders, which he is on the cover. This goes into a fair amount of detail. But normally, like, when you look something up on spec, or if you have a more encyclopedic book like that, it doesn't go into great detail. So since I don't have any books specifically on spec, and I haven't read any, even though I, I know there's some out there, I, I have them in my wish list, that I don't quite know the finer details of certain things as I do other stories. But I was surprised to see that he wasn't in World's Worst Crimes or this Mass Killers book, which I think this one is mostly just shooters. But he does have a, uh... well, I did pull it. He's not in this Time Life magazine, but I have another one of uh, Most Notorious Crimes. He is in that one. So, uh, yeah, there's not, I, I don't have a lot of material on spec, and the stuff I do have is kind of vague, so if I do get anything wrong in this video as far as the fact from fiction portion, it's because I'm not as well versed as I am with other killers. But with that, I guess we'll get into the cliff notes and then the uh, film itself. So I know I did this already for my last video, but just in case anybody missed that, uh, and I always like to do this. I always like to give sort of a brief clip notes or like a brief summary of the killer that the film is about. So uh, Richard Speck, often called the serial killer, is actually one of the most notorious mass murderers where on July 13th and into the 14th of 1966 at 11 p.m. he entered a residence of nine student nurses and over the course of four hours he one by one stabbed and or strangled each one and sexually assaulted the last one, Gloria Davy. One of the nurses, Corazon Amaral, was able to hide under a bed and survive and give a description of him. He was arrested less than a week later after being recognized by his born to raise hell tattoo by a doctor in the hospital following a suicide attempt in fear that he, that he will be caught. Speck was sentenced to death, but after Illinois overturned his death penalty it was commuted to eight life sentences 
He died December 5th, 1991 of a heart attack the day before his 50th birthday. Speck was a natural born criminal getting into petty crimes at an early age. His first being an arrest for trespassing at 13. Uh, he would eventually go on to have 42 arrests uh, just in the Dallas, Texas area. He he was also a raging alcoholic who started drinking at age 12 and was drunk every day by 15. Dropped out of school on his 16th birthday. He committed new, numerous thefts and robberies and served jail time numerous times between 63 and 66. He also committed several armed robberies and he was... He's known to have stabbed one man during a bar fight. He also committed uh, uh, several rapes around this time, rapes and robberies. Though he was never convicted of other murders, he, he was a suspect in the disappearance of 32-year-old Mary Catherine Pierce in April of 1966 in Monmouth, Illinois, where he committed several other armed robberies and sexual assaults. Before he could be officially questioned, he fled to Chicago, where that July he would commit what papers called the crime of the century. And in 1996, a video was leaked and later shown on, I believe it was Bill Curtis's American Justice, that showed an elderly speck, this was around 89 or 90, where he had had enlarged breasts due to years of smuggling growth hormones and sharing a copious amount of cocaine with his cellmate and gleefully talking about how much fun he has in prison, doing drugs, and how much he enjoyed killing those eight nurses in Chicago. Uh, American Justice did not air the entire video, which would go on to show him performing fellatio and having sex with his cellmate. This was highly controversial, not only due to the content, but also just because of his gleeful attitude and his seemingly lack of remorse for his actions. Even though Speck was known to be this violent, natural-born criminal, he was known to actually be soft-spoken and polite, and often very cowardly, especially with authorities. The only time he really would get violent or put on a tough guy attitude was when he wanted to steal or assault someone and he'd already had some booze in them. Other than that, he's known to be rather polite and rather cowardly. And so now with that, we get to the actual film itself. Now, I didn't actually think I was going to have as many notes as I did, but uh, so it opens up just up close of his face, smoking a cigarette if they knew how much fun I was having, that they let me loose, which is part of his controversial, controversial 1996 video. Uh, we jump back a bit uh, to him stealing a truck and sentenced to counseling, but he decides not to go to counseling and he sneaks on a train to Chicago. Now, of course, he committed numerous robberies and thefts around this time. Now, one... Uh, yes, Corey Nemec does have a very sinister portrayal of Speck, you know, being very loud, commanding, mean, and taunting. At one point, even putting a sheet over one of the nurses, going like, woo, like acting, making her act like a ghost in front of the other nurses. <laughs> Excuse me. But here in the beginning, when he steals this truck, there's like a piano outside. And he's got like this cowboy hat and he's doing like, goes up to the piano, he's doing like this hoedown dance with like, come on down to Texas, go or Nick and And then he steals this lady's truck. Now, I think this is actually based on a real character because we see this woman, you know, she addresses him by Richard, gets mad at him, says he's no good. She has two young children. So I think. She's actually, based on this, uh, and I don't know her name, but his mother set him up with this uh, a divorced woman who was a former wrestler and a bartender. But he lived with her, and he would babysit her three young kids. Uh, 
but then I believe the last arrest that he had in that area was when he stole 70 cartons from a grocery store and sold them out in the parking lot. Uh, that would have been his, or it was his 42nd arrest in Dallas. He was fined $10, served three days, and then his sister drove him to the bus station for a bus to Chicago instead of sneaking on a train. Uh, flashbacks to him being abused by his stepfather. That's true. His real father died, I think, when he was six. Uh, he looked up to his father. You know, both his parents did not drink. They were very well-to-do people. But then she married this abusive alcoholic that just <laughs> would uh, physically and emotionally abuse Richard. And it doesn't go into it much. It's really just one scene. It shows him... Uh, knowing one of the nurses beforehand, um, now I don't know if this woman was one of the nurses later on in the film. I don't think he knew any of the nine that he attacked, but he did know a nurse from that area because he was working on some sort of crew, like a, a lake firefighter. But of course, every time an assignment came up, he always missed it. And I think the... The office he had to go to was like right next to the uh, home of the nurses. And the one he knew didn't loan him money, but I, I think the one that loaned him money wasn't one of the ones that he attacked. But again, I don't know if this character was one that showed up. Because you can't really tell who's who uh, in this film. Uh, sh shows him armed with a gun from the very beginning. Which I think at first he was armed with a switchblade. Uh, it shows him walking right through the front door. Which I've read that he broke in through the window. Yet I've also read in some places that he knocked on the door. And Amaral opened it. Then that's when he rushed in and attacked her. Or at least I heard that somewhere. But most sources I've read has said that he crawl through a window uh now the nurse's home looked like a regular house like a house house kind of a cramped two-level house whereas this looks like a one-story facility you know tile floor fluorescent lights it, it looks like a hospital so which another thing is this is supposed to be 1966 there are a few goofs, like, I don't remember if it's the hotel he's staying at or the police department, but there's, like, a fax machine and a modern computer there on the desk. Uh, some of the interior set designs do look 60s. This house is not one of them. Again, it looks more like a... some sort of health facility rather than a house. Um... I put the, the Sandra, hold on, give me a second, uh, I'm taking a pause, uh, Azano, uh, I'm going to keep forgetting that, uh, uh, I'm just going to call her Amaral because that's what I know her as, that's her real name, um, they actually did get a, a Filipino actress, or at least I think she's Filipino, so that was really the only way to make her stand out. Um, so at first he rounds up four girls and then one comes home from her date or with friends and then he grabs her and then that's when it cuts out chronologically. In reality, he had six girls and then, um, either one by one, three more came home or one came home, then two more came home. So, and that's another thing that this movie is very confusing because it's not chronological. There's a lot of flashbacks. Even the attacks are mostly shown through flashbacks. That a lot of times it's hard to tell. Other than the attacks. Like other points of his life. It's hard to tell what timeline it is. Like. Sure he he, he has different hair. In his the flashbacks. But like the scene where he has this prostitute. In his hotel room after the murders. 
that I was sitting there thinking, like, is this supposed to be now or is this another flashback? Or even to, like, right before the murders to, like, show how he got the pistol because that's how he got it. He attacked a woman in his hotel room and stole her pistol. But, no, I guess that was present. It was really hard to tell what timeline we were in because of all the flashbacks. Um, so we cut to a new story about the murders. We're introduced to Detective Whitaker, played by Andrew uh, Divop, who I think is based on Jack G. Walenda, who I think was the main detective on the spec case. Tony Todd plays another uh, a detective. He says all eight were beaten, strangled, stabbed, and raped. Which, in reality, only the final victim, Gloria Davy, was the only one that was sexually assaulted. Uh, I did put Sandra Azano, lone survivor, hiding under the bed. We get a brief glimpse of that. So that's true. Uh, shows one being shot in the bathtub. Now, none of them were shot. He had the gun to hold him at gunpoint, but he, not, he didn't shoot any of them. I'm guessing that was supposed to be based on Patricia Matusek, who was killed in the bathroom, the only one to be killed in the bathroom. But he he kicked her in the stomach and then strangled her. So then they walk around the house, and we see... Now, the first one in real life was found in the the couch on the living room, like right when you walk in. That was Gloria Davy. Uh, but the first bedroom we get to had three girls, true, which Pamela Wilkening, who was stabbed in the chest and strangled, Suzanne Ferris, who was stabbed 18 times and her underwear was shredded, and Marianne Jordan, who was stabbed in the heart, neck, and eye. That was in the first room that detectives got to in real life. Then there was, in the film, there was two in the next bedroom, when actually the, there were three. And then two more in this final room, which had the rest of them. But again, so there was couch, bathroom, three and three. And I meant to put the name of the girls and all the other ones, but it, it's kind of hard to take notes and watch at the same time. Uh, Speck seen with the stewardess and making her uncomfortable at the bar immediately after. I don't know. It does have the scene where he asks the bartender if he knows what it's like to choke someone. Which I think that might have actually happened before. I know after he did ask, you know, have you ever killed someone? Bartender says no. And he says, well, I have. I don't know if this scene was sort of a mixture of both of them. Uh, detective says he knows one of the, the nurses I've read that he knew a few of them, but I've never read which ones he knew specifically. Uh, they're able to get a sketch from the survivor, which is true. She provided a description to get a sketch and, you know, enough info that Born to Raise Hell is tattooed on his forearm. Which, in this, it's like up here where he had it on his forearm in real life. Um... They get his, and then this is where the uh, the investigation really, because the investigation I really don't know about. As far as I know, they only caught him because he attempted suicide, went to the hospital, and the doctor notices born to raise health tattoo. That's really all I know. So getting his name from uh, uh, Union Papers, like going around showing his sketch, and the woman says, yeah, he works here. Then giving him the uh, union papers. I don't think that's true. I don't think there was a manhunt for Richard Speck. Uh, I don't think they had a name until he was in the hospital and they came to check him out. I could be wrong on that. But uh, uh, a, a detective pretty much knowing it's Richard Speck and kind of tailing him, like seeing him at the bar, then leaving. I don't think that happened. Uh, flashback to him living with his wife and being abusive. Uh, he was married to Shirley Annette Malone in January of 62. After three months of dating, his daughter Robbie Lynn was born that July. 
They divorced in 66. She never accompanied him to Monmouth or uh, uh, Chicago. And again, I, I want to say they actually divorced before the attacks because I think he, because I think she ended up being with someone else and this enraged him. So I think it might have actually been that, not while he was in prison. But again, I could be wrong. I probably, I, I shouldn't have bought a book on spec and read that before I watched these, but, um, so then we get a flashback to the attack, telling the girls to tie their feet with bed sheets. Uh, I've read different sources that saying he did all of them himself or, you know, he had some tie themselves up and he did the other ones saying he's not going to hurt them. True. Uh, once they were all rounded up, he did say, I I'm not going to kill you. I I'm not going to hurt you. I just need money so I can get to New Orleans. But here, like the other film, is portraying him as loud, mean, taunting, of almost like a bully and vulgar. Maybe not quite as much as like a Rob Zombie character like the last one. But still, you know, being pretty mean, vicious, loud, commanding about it. Where again... Uh, he was known to even be sort of soft-spoken, kind of polite. Um, so, the first one we see him kill, he stabs like over a dozen times. It's like her POV, sort of this weird angle up close like this. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact amount of times. And again, I don't even know if these flashbacks are in the right order, so... The hotel he's staying at looks rather nice. Everything I've read and heard about, it was kind of a flea bag motel. I could be wrong. It, it was the uh, Shipyard Inn in Chicago. Never been there, never seen, so I, I don't really know what it looks like. But he, he's with a prostitute, and he tries to assault her, but it, he's too drunk, so she leaves. Uh, she has the... Uh, lady at the counter called the police. The police show up. They they check him out. They see that his name is Richard Speck, but that he signed in under a different name. That he doesn't have proper paperwork for his pistol, so they confiscate it. And I think it's supposed to be just one of those scenes where it's just like, oh, you you let him go, because they even say like, you look like a hardworking man. You know, we're not going to go through all the formalities. Just, you know, we are going to confiscate this. And he's very compliant. I don't think this scenario ever took place. I think it's just supposed to be one of those... Kind of like in Netflix Dahmer when he had Stephen Hicks' body in his back seat in trash bags. And the cop says, you know, you got your whole life ahead of you. I'm not going to fuck it up by arresting you. Now, of course, that's not how that went down in real life with Dahmer. But I think to kind of make you go, oh, you had him. So they don't arrest him. The woman at the counter asks about it. And they're like, oh, no, he he's a, a hardworking boat guy or something. Uh, boat worker. Which, yeah, he was a lake firefighter. He was on a crew. But he missed out on two big jobs because he was either getting drunk or he missed the missed out on seniority or he just couldn't get to the office in time. And he was not hardworking. He was always drunk, getting in fights or getting fired or arrested for something. Uh, detective shows up at the hotel to catch Speck after the cops leave and he finds out it, it was Richard Speck, but he's already gone. Don't think that ever happened. Plus, he also stayed at the hotel until his suicide attempt. Flashback to another attack, sexually assaulting one. He only did it to one. So I'm guessing this one is supposed to be Gloria Davy. Uh, Speck staying amongst uh, all these homeless people. He's laying down with these homeless people and he's covered in blood. So uh, it, I don't remember them showing him doing anything to his wrist. So I'm thinking like, was this immediately after the murders? Like, did he just go here right after? And then this hobo comes up talking to him and doesn't say anything about the blood. 
just tell him he's got the devil in him. But then the scene immediately cuts to, you know, looking down at him on a gurney being wheeled to, to the hospital. So I'm assuming that was his suicide attempt, which I don't even remember them showing him doing anything. Him just laying there covered in blood. Um, but that is what put him in the hospital. Another flashback to the attack. Uh, one of the girls is still alive and moaning. He goes back to strangle her. Uh, I don't think that was the case. I think he made sure they were dead before he went to go get another one. Plus, with how overkill he went on each one, I think it'd be hard for any of them to be left alive for that to happen. Uh, so then the doctor notices his tattoo, which is true, but we get a little bit extra where he brings the nurse out to show that we know how he knows by showing the newspaper, born to raise hell. It's that guy from the nurses. Then he gives him a sedative and, you know, gets in his face like, I don't let you die. No, but no, too easy. I'm going to let you go to jail forever. I don't know if it was that intense or real. Maybe it was. Um, flashback to the attack of him dragging another girl away in the uh, Amaral character. is able to free her feet binds, run to another bedroom and hide under the bed in a separate room. And then he brings the girl in that room and kills her on the bed. Now, again, it pretty much showed him sexually assaulting the previous one. I, I guess it implies he did it to all of them. But I'm pretty sure Amaro hid under a bed in that same room where they were all, you know, where they're all together when they all got taken away separately. But he did sexually assault one of them on the bed that she was hiding under, and that was the last one, Gloria Davy. Um... They have Amaro uh, ID him while he's in the hospital. Uh, true. I Now, he wasn't sedated in this scene. He was sedated in real life. It does show the doctors asking him his name, and he just goes, Richard Speck, which I think that's how that played out. When she goes in to ID him, I don't think they put her in a nurse's outfit. I could be wrong on that as well. But he, like, yells at her or something. I'm pretty sure in real life he was heavily sedated. But then the uh, Andrew Divoff detective comes in because he's, like, strapped down. He chokes him for a bit. And then Speck has a tantrum. Uh, like, you know, fight me fair. Fight me fair. Fight me fair. It, I, it, Speck was a coward in real life. I, I think he cowered down to everyone at this point because he was caught. Uh, so then his trial, we see Amaral called called to the stand, asked to identify her attacker, and she gets up. She gets up, walks right over to him, points right at him, almost touching, and says, this is him. That is true. That did happen. And I have heard stuff about how Speck was kind of childlike during the uh, trial. You know, having his chin on the table, kind of playing with his ashtray, just kind of looking all around and everything that's how he's portrayed here um shows him getting ready for a parole hearing but he tells them to tell the board to kiss his ass i don't know if he was like that but he had at least five parole hearings therapy session where he admits to killing and doesn't seem to care about that them or the fact he's going to be in jail forever that was known to be his attitude. He really didn't give a shit after a while. Then we get an end text that says, After his death penalty was overturned, he was sentenced to 400 to 1,200 years. I've seen those numbers everywhere I've read, so that's true. It mentions the 1996 video, but it says 1995. And in 91, found dead due to an enlarged heart. He was 50. The enlarged heart was was the cause of his heart attack, but it was actually the day before his 50th birthday. And so then, that's the end text on a black screen, but then we go back to the opening of the film, 
where he says, they knew how much fun I was having. They, they let me loose. And they pretty much show what's known or what was seen in that 1996 video. And the angle is pretty much the same. You know, him in one chair, you, you can see how they added the hormone-grown breasts. Shows him sitting in his underwear, his cellmate next to him. Shows him with a big thing of cocaine in between them. And, yeah, it, it looks very similar. The, the room doesn't, but the way they're sitting and the way he looks is very similar to the video itself. Now, a lot of the lines I don't remember from what I've seen in the video. Again, I haven't seen the whole thing. But, you know, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, show people in La La Land how, how we do things around here. I, I run the show. I run this prison. They're pretty much just talking nonstop. I actually don't think it said any lines from at least the footage that I've seen. But the last thing we hear is uh, turn the cameras off so we can have some fun. And then that's when the movie ends. So, yeah, I was actually surprised that it kind of put that in there i don't know if it was for exploitation for shock value or because that video was so controversial in real life that they added it in there because if you think about it there's not much about speck's life even during the time of the chicago massacre so the fact that they're making that as detailed as possible almost does feel exploitative or just for the sake of showing it even though it kind of does feel out of context even though the end text does explain it so overall yeah this is not a very good richard speck film even if you take the true crime aspect out of it i wouldn't even say it's that good of a mass murder you know detective procedural film either the non-chronological nature and narrative is kind of hard to follow at times. Hard to tell when scenes are supposed to be placed or what timeline we're in. It really doesn't make any of the nurses characters other than the survivor. The other ones are all sort of blended together. You, know, you don't get a sense that there's any individuals in there. So it's hard to tell who is who. Uh, the best thing about it would be Cor Anemic. And it's not even to say that he's amazing as a, a Richard Speck. I mean, he's passable. But he's a talented enough actor to be able to make what he's given work. And that's what he was able to do. He, he was able to make the best of what he was given. So... All around, it's not that good of a Richard Speck film. And no, not just because it doesn't... I mean, it, it shows enough of the murders. I mean, if you want to show it just through flashbacks, that's fine. But flashbacks of other things mixed in can make it kind of confusing. Uh, and again, I don't mind if a real-life serial killer film doesn't really show the graphic stuff. Again surface level people will get mad at that because they think that's all that's important and if it's not as graphic as august underground mortem then what's the point okay as long as it take tries to be accurate and tries to not fictionalize it so much which most of this film is maybe it's because from what i've read there's not much of an investigation i mean he was arrested three days after the attack, he was arrested on the 17th. So, I mean, yeah, not much to this film. If if you want to go for accuracy and see more of what the actual Chicago Massacre was like, just watch the 2002 film. And I'm not sure how accurate this one is, but there is one from, I think, 76 called Born for Hell. But there's also numerous documentaries, I mean... There's the American Justice one. There's, I'm sure there's one from Born to Kill. I think there's one called Born to Raise Hell. All kinds of stuff. Uh, I would say skip over this one, which is kind of being a theme with ones written and directed by Michael Pfeiffer. Not as bad as an Uwe Lamel film. 
almost feels like a glorified Uwe Lavelle film. So those are my Richard Speck films. We are getting down to the very end of my real life serial killer movie collection. We're nearing the end of the month. Uh, I'm sure I'll pick up more at some point, but uh, I do have a few more left, so stay tuned for those, and uh, thank you for watching.